Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello and welcome everybody to a new broadcast on the wonderful platform from Grand Design Exposed, Hour of the Truth. Today we have Thursday, the 23rd of April, 2015. I'm Jörg from Joggler66, from the YouTube channel Joggler66. And as a guest, I have tonight with me Tom Press from Inquisition Update, because I think we really make a very good team and a very good broadcast the latest weeks. I hope you also enjoyed these, and you surely will enjoy this one tonight. But before we are going to start with the topic that was announced today, and that is um, Pope Francis' new climate change encyclical sneak preview, where we are talking about, well, Pope Francis and his agenda, and especially probably also his agenda when he comes to the United States of America later this year, and I have also a few articles prepared to read before that and to talk about that with Tom. I want to go back to our last broadcast that we did. And our last broadcast was called, as you probably remember, uh, Times and Laws Changed by Rome. And uh, we were focusing, of course, on the time change, uh, you know, the 11 days that were taken out in 1582 out of the calendar. In 1582, where uh, from the 4th of October, it went directly to the 15th of October. It means that the Pope thinks that he can change times. And then afterwards, we had a very, uh, very good discussion on the, uh, on the view of the Sabbath, because that is the law that... Pope uh, that the Pope tried to change or tries to change and it just occurred to me uh, last night that we forgot about one very important point to talk about that and um, I want to invite Tom directly to uh, talk with me or discuss with me that point that we uh, forgot about to talk last night and that is where the Roman Catholic Church actually changed the Ten Commandments we were talking about how there are different views on the fourth commandment, but we totally forgot to mention that the Roman Catholic Church in their catechism took out the second commandment and split the ten commandments in two. So to remind you of what that uh, exactly is, um, that second commandment, so that everybody knows what we are talking about right here, I take, of course, the King James Bible, as our basis, as we always do. And there you have on Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments that Moses receives on Mount Sinai. And, uh, of course, you know the, uh, the first commandment, uh, that is, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment reads, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And the Roman Catholic Church changed, uh, took out this commandment completely and changed the Ten Commandment that normally should read, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's. And the Roman Catholic Church just split that up in two parts to come back again to ten commandments, because they cannot say, well, we only have nine, they also have to have ten. But they took out the second of the idolatry of the images which is, of course, very profound to know, because when you enter a Roman Catholic Church, everything you see are just idols. You have uh, statues of Mary, you have statues of St. Peter, you have statues of Jesus, you have the cross. I mean, I can go on and on and on for hours about the idolatry of the Roman Catholic Church. And I remember that Tom made a broadcast uh, a time ago when we were still uh, talking on the broadcast, Nothing But The Truth, and I missed that one, I only heard it, and he made a broadcast about how this uh, idolatry, this graven images commandment, is very uh, important in relation to sodomy. So Tom, I would ask you 
tonight to start about this changing of the Roman Catholic Church of the actual second commandment from the Ten Commandments that God gave, written with his own finger in two stone tablets to Moses on Mount Sinai, and what the Roman Catholic Church did with that, and what is the relation between uh, the uh, idolatry and making images and sodomy. Oh, very interesting. Uh, first, I would like to apologize to your listeners for that embarrassing omission. Uh, the point I was making last time we were here, that the civil power uh, is given its jurisdiction over the second table of the law, how man should relate to man. And uh, only God has jurisdiction over the first table of the law. And uh, yet the popes uh, have violated institutionally they have violated all of the all of the commandments of the first table of the law the first commandment is i am the god that brought thee out of the land of egypt out of the house of bondage thou shalt have no other gods before me okay god was speaking of himself no other gods before me and yet the papacy expects mankind to bow down and kiss his feet and to obey him as though he were God, hidden behind a veil of flesh. You covered quite adequately what we uh, embarrassingly omitted in our last broadcast, the prohibition of images and idols, and I'll get back to that and answer your question specifically, and it might be a surprise to most of the listeners who've never heard the truth about it before. The third commandment is the Sabbath, and we all know... <clears throat> that uh, Rome, it was Rome that changed, that transferred, according to her definition, transferred the sanctity of God's Sabbath, the seventh day, to the first day of the week. And all Christianity, uh, nearly all Christianity, there are a few uh, holdouts for the truth yet uh, that still venerate the seventh day. But as a rule, all Christianity has followed the error of Rome and keeps the first day of the week as though it were Sabbath. Let me just interrupt you there, Thomas. Yes. That is the fourth commandment. The third commandment is, Thou shalt oh, not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I'm for sorry. the Lord will not uh, hold him guilty that taketh his name in vain. No, yes. that's, 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 we are just people. We can make a little mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have the text right in front of me, but I've memorized it by heart. Yes, thou I shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And he who calls himself God, and he who expects men to bow down and kiss his feet, he who thunders from his throne in Rome and expects all of humanity to obey his laws, both his spiritual teachings and his civil power, his, law, his, his, his Roman Catholic canon law, has indeed taken the name of the Lord, our God, in vain. He takes it in vain. In vain, in, in, uh, vanity, in vanity does he worship God by claiming God's throne. It's a waste of time. That's why God calls it vanity. Now, we're dealing with the second commandment, forbidding the making and bowing down of images and idols. Uh, that is dealt with specifically in Romans chapter 1. And Romans chapter 1 lays out, <clears throat> excuse me, a frog in my throat, lays out a divine recompense for those who make and bow down and worship images and idols. Now, I know it's never taught this way in the scriptures, but a plain English reading of Romans chapter 1 sets forth a punishment, a divine recompense for those who are so foolish to reduce God, to corrupt his body by making it in the form of an image or an idol to be bowed down and worshipped. 
whether that idol be that of a human being or any other creature, uh, four-footed beasts or creeping things or birds, or anything. you see this always in the pagan religions. God being represented as bulls, uh, as the sun, or any other created thing. God is holy. God is a living entity. He walks, he talks, he hears, he answers prayer. He is eternal. He never sleeps. He always works. He is infinitely holy beyond our comprehension. And he wishes to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And the way to corrupt our understanding, the best way to corrupt our understanding, and any concept, any right concept of the God of creation, is to reduce him to a man-made thing. Now one has to realize that God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. His wisdom is infinite. He is eternal in existence. He is wise beyond any understanding. He is perfect in every way. And he only wishes to be worshipped with that understanding. Now mankind was created in the Garden of Eden by God. He was created like God. He walked, he talked, he lived, he could hear, and he had wisdom. And yet man corrupted his way by doing that which God forbid. And as a result, fell. In his existence, he fell. He changed in his nature and his, and his appearance. And he also, because of his sin, because of his rebellion against God, death came into the world. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, man in his original creation was beneath God, obviously, inferior to God, inferior to the angels, inferior to any and all of the heavenly host. So at least he was four levels of glory beneath the Father when he was created. Even the perfect man, Adam, before he had sinned, was like God, but his glory was diminished at least five realms. What happened after the fall was another glory lost. Now, what if that man were to think himself so wise as to reduce the incorruptible God into a corruptible image, an image even inferior to fallen man? Now, we, would, we can all understand how infantile it is for a man to mound up some clay and fashion it into an image, or to whittle a piece of wood, or to smelt some iron, or gold, or silver, or any other thing, and fashion himself a god and call it God, and then bow down and worship it. An image or an idol that cannot see, cannot speak, cannot think, cannot hear, cannot answer prayer, can't even walk, much less clean itself. The man must dust his image and his idol. Now, God views a man, fallen man, who in his depravity thinks himself just and right, to reduce the incorruptible glory of Almighty God, an inconceivable glory, into that which is even inferior to the sinful fallen man that made it, is the quickest way to raise the ire of a 
all holy God. Anyone who thinks himself so wise that he can fashion God in any likeness with his fallen hands will garner God's wrath. It's an insult. As a matter of fact, from God's point of view, it's filthy. It's detestable. It's corrupt. And man deludes himself. Any man who makes or bows down and worships man-made images and idols of any fashion is detestable in God's eyes. He has reduced himself to the wisdom of a brute beast. And he infuriates God because he has lessened God into a tangible thing that is far inferior even to the hands of the fallen man that made it. It's like reducing God to filth. So God causes man to do likewise to his own body. Reduces him to filth, to perversion. And Romans chapter 1 is as plain an explanation of this that is found anywhere else in the Bible. See, the second commandment forbidding images and idols, that commandment which the Roman Catholic Church completely eliminated out of the first table of the law, which is God's jurisdiction and no one else's, says it's not only all right to make and bow down and worship images and idols, but they they create, they amass a tremendous amount of wealth through the sale of these filthy, detestable images and idols. Now, what spiritual life can be generated from the worship of images and idols? None. They're sterile. No life can be generated through the worship of images and idols. Only death. As a matter of fact, other places in the Scriptures plainly tell us when you worship images and idols, you worship demons. Is that how man should worship God? No spiritual life can come from it. It's filthy. It's detestable. It's perverted. And so is sodomy. No physical life can result It's filthy, it's detestable, and it even defies common sense. The common sense you will find even in the brute beasts of the world. They do not copulate in same sex. Even the wisdom of a brute beast exceeds that of a fallen man who would corrupt God's body so much that he would produce an image or an idol that he's even incalculable, incalculably inferior to the man who made it. It's just common sense that if we worship an all-holy God who creates the heavens and the earth with the word of his mouth, formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and said, follow me, not only follows the deceiver, but does that which God detests. And every time in the Bible when men bowed down and worshipped images and idols or groves or any other created thing, the sun, the moon, the stars, God reduces them to filth. And that's exactly what happened in Sodom and Egypt. Sodom and Gomorrah worshipped images and idols. And likewise, it was found in Sodom and Gomorrah and every other place where idolatry is found, you find sodomy. Because it's a divine recompense for imagery and idolatry. 
It's a divine recompense. Wherever you find idolatry, you will find sodomy. And wherever you find sodomy, you will find idolatry. It's God's divine act of retribution against someone who is so corrupt in their understanding of God that they would corrupt him likewise. Therefore, God just simply corrupts them the same way. The Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. And thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, listen carefully, visiting or returning to them visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Who are those that hate God? Why, those who would reduce him to a man-made thing. He visits that iniquity upon the children to the third and fourth generation of idolaters. Those that hate him. Idolaters. You want to know how to express hatred for God? Just reduce him to a man-made thing. There's no better way, there's no more effective way to incite the wrath of Almighty God than to reduce him to a man-made thing. And his retribution is, a, is visible all over the world. And guess where it is most visible? Among the priesthood of the church that took out that second commandment. Took it out as if they had jurisdiction over the first table of the law as if they were so wise as to become fools and reduce the incorruptible God into corruptible images, of man-made images of four-footed beasts and birds and creeping things and crime of all crimes to elevate the Pope to deity on the earth. And that's why his priests are pedophiles. That's why when little children come up missing in this world, no matter where they are, the first place to look for them is in the Roman Catholic priesthood or in any other idolatrous cult like Freemasonry. Any people that bow down and worship man-made images and idols suffer the divine recompense, sodomy. What they do to God, God does to them likewise, so that they would understand the error of their ways, so that they would be able to look at their deficiency, look at their sin, look at their depravity, look at their perversion, and wonder within themselves, how did I get this way? Why am I not tr attracted to the opposite sex the way God made us? Well, the answer is simple. You're reduced to this filth because you reduced God to filth. Remember, I remember talking to a, a friend of mine professed to be a Christian, began to read the scriptures for himself. And yet one day, in frustration, he said, Tom, he said, I just can't, I just can't worship a God that I can't see. You see how the Roman Catholic Church ruined him? When he walked into that church, he saw images of God images of Christ on a cross, images of Mary, images of saints, images behind a flesh and blood man called the Pope. 
an idol of all idols, a filthy fallen man and a pedophile to boot. He said, I just can't worship a God that I can't see. But we're not allowed to see him. Because he's so holy, he's so bright, he's so powerful, that even to look upon him, you would be consumed. Remember the story of Moses when he went up to the mountain. He was not allowed to see God. And only with God's hand over the crack, and only could he see his hinder parts, and yet even then... When he came down off the mountain, they said his face shone like the sun. His hair was white as snow. Yet he'd never seen God's glory. Imagine a man. Any man in this world that thinks himself so wise as to become a fool and reduce that glory of God into a man-made, a filthy man-made image, made like unto corruptible man and four-footed beasts and creeping things, now you can understand why God's wrath is immediately displayed against one who's so so foolish. You know, you can go through all the professions, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists. I mean, every profession in the world, nobody can explain the cause of sodomy. And yet it's right in the Bible. The first chapter of Romans. Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, and guess what? It's the very first chapter of the very first epistle that Paul wrote from Rome. The very first issue that Paul dealt with in Rome was sodomy. Why? Because it's the city of idolatry, and it's also the city of sodomy. Have you ever heard of the Roman baths? Do you know anything about them? That's where sodomy was practiced in the open. It was practiced in the streets in Rome. It was the very image of Sodom itself. Paul didn't leave it to be the second issue that he dealt with, or the third or the fourth. No, it was the first issue that Paul dealt with when he went to Rome, and in the first, ver- the first chapter of his first book on Romans, he hit them right between the eyes. He hit the very thing for which Israel was punished, bowing down and worshiping images and idols and reducing God to a filthy thing. Well, it was a way of life in Rome. And if he ever hoped to build a godly church in Rome, he had to speak out against the crime of idolatry, the perversion of idolatry, the filthiness of idolatry, the blasphemy of idolatry. And he clearly laid out God's divine recompense in payment for it. That's what recompense means, recompense or repay. He repaid the Romans just like he repaid all idolaters, especially Sodom and Gomorrah. He repaid them with a like filth. No spiritual life can come of it. No physical life can come of it. It reduces God to filth, and it reduces themselves to filth. No one but a brute beast would bow down and worship a man-made thing. And so God caused him to do that which not even brute beasts do, sodomy. Remember, it's God's judgment. 
the remnants, the remains of Sodom still exist today, right where Josephus said they were, right along the road that runs along the Dead Sea. Anybody can park along the road, walk out across that narrow strip of desert into the old city of Sodom, a burned-out ruin, take a pick hammer with you, pick up any stone and, and crack it in half, and inside each stone you'll find the remnant of the sulfur, perfectly pure and preserved to this day. And you can pick out that little piece of sulfur. It's normally round in shape that it burned itself into the rock you can fracture that rock with a pick hammer, an archaeologist's hammer, take out that little crumb or, or bowl, uh, a marble-shaped or marble-sized piece of sulfur, put it in a spoon and light it with a big lighter, and look out. Preserved it to this very day. It's a tourist attraction. Right where Josephus said it was, right where it's recorded in the Bible, Right along the Dead Sea, it's still there, and it'll be there till Christ returns as an eternal te- testimony. God has already judged sodomy. And any nation who practices it and will not repent of it by repenting of their idolatry will be judged the same way. <clears throat> the United States of America... Even this little state that I live in, right here in the middle of this country, probably one of the most conservative states there is, yet it too has legalized sodomy, has legalized sodomite marriage. You know, when you can't discover a cure, a biblical cure for sodomy, and Idolatry is practiced everywhere, and divine and God's divine recompense is evident everywhere you look. What do you do about it if you can't find a cure? And it's so overwhelming, overwhelmingly practiced that you can't. You, well, you can't put everybody in jail. What do you have to do? You have to mainstream it, just like they did in Sodom. It was practiced in the streets. They even went after God's angels. That's what they're doing. They're mainstreaming, making normal sodomy. You can't speak a word against a sodomite. You end up being called a hater, a you know, a bigot. You are the problem. They just they just can't deal with it. The psychologists, the doctors, the psychiatrists, the theologians, nobody can come up with a cure for sodomy, yet it is right there in the first chapter of the first book that Paul wrote, Romans. In black and white, in the plainest English you'll find in the Bible, those who think themselves so wise That's to become fools and reduce the incorruptible God into corruptible things like man made, like men or four footed beasts or creeping things. God does to them likewise. Men with men doing that which is unseemly. And that's putting it mildly. And it's uh, everywhere, it's being legalized in this country. I think I've made my point. I want to make one more year before I give it back to you. Whenever you hear the word homosexuality, correct that individual and tell them it's sodomy. Remember Sodom? Where God sent a deluge of fire and brimstone in judgment of that curse? It's not homosexuality. It's sodomy. 
And every time you use its proper term, you acknowledge the Bible and you acknowledge God's righteous judgment upon Sodom. And why was Sodom practicing openly sodomy? Because they bowed down and worshipped images and idols. Had they been serious about looking for a cure for their plague of sodomy, they would have discovered in their own sin what was the divine recompense, why God was punishing them. Because they reduced him to filth. Take the word homosexuality out of your vocabulary and replace it with the biblical definition, sodomy. That's a very good point, Tom. But (laughs) the problem is that they do just the other way around. When you look up some modern encyclopedias, dictionaries, you will not find the word sodomy anymore. No. They've taken that out. I did some time ago a search on Google on uh, dictionaries on the word sodomy, and there are some that don't even have that word in them anymore. Now ask yourself, why is that? And that goes together with this whole transgender agenda that they are following for some years already. Here in Europe, it's very blatant. I think also in America you have that with these uh, L- LGBTTI, I don't know what, what, what uh, abbreviations they give all to this, this lesbian, gay, transsexual, transgender, intersexual movement, you know, yeah. taking away the genders. God made, uh, God made men in his image and God made them male and female. That's two genders. And I guess they have, uh, what, uh, I've read an article somewhere where, where they already have some 700 genders or something like that right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is absolutely crazy what they are doing. And, and, and do a search for yourself in, in some uh, modern encyclopedias or modern dictionaries, and you will find that um, not in all of them, but in, in some, you will, even, will not even find the word sodomy anymore. Or it is marked as an old term or a... Uh, um, insulting term, you know, to use sodomy, as Tom just said, uh, that is insulting. Or homosexuality, okay, that is something that you can use. It's, 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 it's maybe a little bit on the border, but you can use homosexuality. But sodomite, when you call someone a sodomite, you are insulting them. Right will be wrong, and wrong, wrong will be right, right? Where do we know that from? That is exactly their agenda. And they're pushing it on every level. They are pushing it on the homosexuality. They are pushing it on uh, on lesbianism, on transsexual and intersexual, and I don't know what name they all find for that. I mean, it's it's, it's so um, you, you you cannot look through it when when you're when you're a person that um, that lives by the Bible like we do. You have really a problem understanding all this stuff because it, it doesn't make any sense, right? Certainly the only place we're ever going to find out the truth about sodomy and its direct link, its cause and effect link with idolatry is in the Bible. And the world hates the Bible. It hates God. It hates his wisdom. It wishes to create a world full of sin. And uh, one of those ways is just to change the name, from sodomy to homosexuality. Because when you use the word homosexuality, there's no link to the Bible, and there's no link to the judgment of Sodom, and there's no link back to idolatry. And that's why, even in the Christian world, even in those who should know better, even those who kept the second commandment in they bow down and worship images and idols. They wear little crosses around their neck, crucifixes around their neck. Even those who would once probably still even call themselves Protestant, they're idolaters, just like their Roman Catholic friends. 
God is not worshipped in temples, and he's not worshipped through images and idols. And if you want God's wrath to be visible in the world, just reduce him to filth. And there's no one that needs to wonder why, of all the occupations in the world, where sodomy is most prevalent is in the Roman Catholic priesthood. It's a global pandemic. It's a global scourge. And yet the American people who call themselves Christians, and most of whom call themselves Protestants, will stand silent and allow the Pope of Rome, the idol of all idols, to come to this country and go into the halls of power and the halls of government of this country and dictate to our government. It should keep you awake at night. It should make the hair stand on the back of your neck. The Antichrist of the Bible now has sway, visible sway. He's had invisible sway almost since the founding of this country, but now he has visible sway in the halls of power and government in the United States of America. And guess what he intends to do? He intends to persecute God's people. He intends to use the civil power to silence any truth from the Bible or history. He intends to silence anybody who would dare to use the word sodomite to describe him or his priests. Government-sponsored religious persecution, that's what will result from this pope coming to the United States of America. I'm going to take a five-minute break. I'll be right back, Yerk. No problem, Tom. That's all right. But now you see why this is very important that we also covered this second commandment that was taken out of the Roman Catholic Church Catechism. That is another proof about how the Roman Catholic Church, uh, especially the popes of the Roman Catholic Church, think um, that they can change times, uh, times and laws by even taking one of the Ten Commandments out, splitting up the Tenth Commandment into two so that they still have ten, and make the people unaware of that they shall not make any graven image, they shall not bow to them or serve them. And this is exactly what happened for the first time in the Bible. I think it was in Exodus chapter 21, <clears throat> after chapter 20, when the Ten Commandments were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, when he came down from Mount Sinai, and he saw the people of Israel were uh, worshipping a golden calf that they made. They made an image over there. And what did Moses do at that time? He crushed the two tables of the law that God gave him, and he burned that golden image, and he went back up into the mountain. And when he came back, he had again the two tablets. And this time, they haven't made any image of it. So... This imagery is something that is very profound to the Bible, that is very important. Otherwise, God wouldn't have written his commandments twice in stone tablets. And even then, the people are betrayed because, you know, I I mentioned that this was changed in the Roman uh, Catholic Catechism, but uh, in a lot of Bibles, you still find the original Ten Commandments. Of course, they don't teach the Ten Commandments, and first of all, they don't even teach the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church has the standpoint that you are too dumb to understand the Bible. You will only understand it when the priest explains it to you. So that's why they formated this catechism. And they teach and read out of the catechism when they are in the churches, when they are in Bible studies and whatever. They teach catechism and not the Bible of itself. So this is a very important point why they took that out. And I think that we really had to elaborate a little bit more on this point um, that we just oversaw last week in our broadcast on uh, how Rome changes times and laws. So I'm sorry for that, but at least we made it up today. And I think we made our point now very clearly. And <clears throat> even in comparison to the fourth commandment, the seventh commandment that we went in extension about last week in our broadcast, um, that commandment has not been changed. It's just not followed anymore, as we explained last week. But this second commandment, they even changed. Black and white, you can check that out when you read through Roman Catholic Catechism, that they really changed it. And 
that is exactly what um, the Bible says, that the man of sin thinks he can change times and laws. He thinks to. He can't, but he thinks to. And that's why he did it and took out the second commandment that Tom just so very explicitly explained to us. But now I want to go on and read uh, a few articles to you um, that um, I have found uh, to start this broadcast today. And the first article comes from the catholicherald.co.uk, so that's over there from England, from Great Britain. It's an article posted Friday, 13th of March, 2015. <laughs> yeah, the 13th of March. You would be a fool to think something bad about that, but Friday the 13th. I hope you all know where Friday the 13th comes from, because a lot of people think that it's superstition. It is not so superstition at all. It goes back to 1307, and the arresting of the Knights Templars in France. They were arrested on Friday the 13th in 1307, and that is why it is generally worldwide today accepted as a day that something bad happened. <laughs> right, Tom? Uh, the idolaters, uh, the Knights Templar, were arrested. And uh, quite frankly, uh, they were arrested because it was widely reported among them that they were sodomites. And not exactly. only that, pedophiles. They <laughs> took their prey upon little children to minimize the risk of getting caught. And uh, it has defined the Roman Catholic Church even from its earliest days. Sodomy. It's the Church of Sodomy. That's what I call it. Now, many people might recoil at that, but it's based in fact. It's based in history, real history, history that anyone can research. Even the earliest councils of the Roman Catholic Church, after they had finished their formal business, went into executive session in private and dealt with the depravity, the sexual depravity of the priests. And uh, it goes on today. It truly does. So this article from the Catholic Herald reads, Pope Francis announces extraordinary jubilee year. Hallelujah. What does he mean by that? A holy year of mercy will begin on December 8th. Pope Francis has declared an extraordinary jubilee year for the church, calling it a quote-unquote holy year of mercy. The year will begin on December 8th, 2015, the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council. Oh, read this. And conclude on November, 8, uh, November 20th, 2016, the Feast of, the Christ, uh, of Christ the King. Tom, you wanted to say something here? Yes, well, <laughs> I mean, the Pope is, uh, you know, basically sounding the final call, last call. We're going to have a year of mercy uh, uh, you know, it's on the anniversary. This is no coincidence. They chose the anniversary of the of uh, Second Vatican Council. What was Vatican Council II? That was a capitulation of the Protestants to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. An you know, ultimatum, ultimatum, as you called it in another broadcast. Yeah, it was that an ultimatum. Ultimatum, ultimatum set for the Protestants to come back under the wings of Rome, or if you don't, we will extirpate yeah. you from the face of the earth. Yes. That's exactly what Vatican Council II was all about. After oh. all this persecution that the Christians suffered all through the years, and the Roman Catholic Church saw that this is not the way to go, they will never get all the Protestants back under their wings in this traditional way, they thought they, ha they, thought they have to infiltrate all the Protestant churches, and by that, turning them back under the wings of Rome, and that was exactly the reason why we did the first four broadcasts on Hour of the Truth with the analysis of the paper that Richard Bennett wrote on the Catholic Lutheran Accord yep. that the Catholic Lutheran Worldwide Federation signed in 1999 in agreement with the Roman Catholic Church to come back under their wings and give up what they actually stand for, what their whole name stands for, the Lutheran Church, the Protestant Church, giving up the protest but giving up the protest not, and that is a point I think we made throughout the broadcast, and if not, I want to repeat it right here because that's most important. The most important point of the Protestants of old, not only Luther and Tyndale and Wycliffe and Huss and 
Zwingli and I don't know, all the other wonderful Protestants at that time, one thing they were all in agreement about, they maybe disagreed on this and on that, but the one thing they all agreed about, and that was the identification of the Roman Catholic Church and the pontiff, the Pope of Rome, as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And there is not one word in that paper of the Roman Catholic Church agreement with the Lutheran Church Federation worldwide that they now accept the Pope not being as Antichrist anymore. It is not even mentioned in one word. It is a paper that is full of Jesuitical casuistry and sophistry by speaking about salvation, righteousness, saving, uh, being saved through grace and faith alone, two good works. That's the way that they change it. It has nothing to do, nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the identification of the Antichrist. Yes. It was unanimously believed among Protestants that the Pope was the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy, and every Pope is just a continuation of that office of Antichrist. The Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. It was, a, it was salvation by works and not uh, by grace through faith. And uh, they were unanimous. They all agreed on that. There was no contention among the Protestants. They all believed the same thing. The, the papacy was the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Judas priest, the Antichrist of the Bible. They're all one and the same. There's no other candidate in the world in history. It's the papacy. They were absolutely correct about it, and and now how could how could they re, how could they retract all that in Vatican Council too? Simply this, that for two hundred years, the churches have been teaching futurism, that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years before Christ returns. And he'll sign a peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to begin animal sacrifices again. And then after three and a half years, he'll cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Those very scriptures are in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. They speak of none other than Christ himself. It was he who confirmed the covenant with many of his people for seven years for one week. Everybody knows his ministry lasted seven years. In the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his, his, his own life. And then through the Holy Spirit, continued to witness to Jerusalem and the Jews until the end of that 70th and final week. And then the gospel went to the Gentiles. Ro Rome destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city. And Israel ceased to exist as a nation. He fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled all of that prophecy. There's not one word in all that prophecy having to do with the Antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But see, they twisted that. The Jesuits came up with a real clever scheme to get the Protestants to quit believing that the Pope is the Antichrist, that the papacy is the Antichrist. And every pope is the Antichrist. Well, they simply pinned it on a single individual that fulfills that prophecy at the end of time, the last week before Jesus returns, the last seven years, the Great Tribulation, they call it. And, they and all of Christianity gap, believes, pardon? And they put a gap of 2,000 years between the 69th week and the 70th week that in their Jesuit futurism agenda still is to being fulfilled. Right, exactly. Tom, Tom, I, I, I love your explanation of that, and, and you can really go on with that, but I just want to make the little point that anybody who is interested in learning about who the Antichrist is, and that stated on 26 very, very profound characteristics, all of them that can be found in the Bible and in the history past, turn to the videos that I've uploaded under the, uh, under the title uh, Characteristics of Antichrist. There are uh, six or seven videos out right now, and there will be a completion of the series that will make, make four, uh, 11 videos in total. So far, are still to, to upload for me. And uh, there you can see that there's absolutely no doubt who the Antichrist, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is based on the Bible, the King James Bible. 
I don't want to say right this. And the Roman Catholic Church just invented a 2,000-year gap so that between the 69 weeks, which everybody accepts are fulfilled, the Roman Catholic Church teaches there's still one week, seven years to come, and this is the whole teaching of, like Tom so rightfully said, the false tribulation about to come, and of course, including the so-called rapture, which is a Roman word that doesn't, that doesn't even exist in the Bible. And there are so many misled Christians who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture or a mid-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture, rapture, and their eyes will be very much open when the tribulation that the Roman Catholic Church will play before the theater of the world when they want to, and there will nobody be lifted up to heaven. And by that, I want to make a little last point before you can go on, Tom. And I want to advise people to get the book from Nicholas Arthur from CrossTheBorder.org. The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. Read that book and understand that. And watch the videos, Characteristics of Antichrist. I have an own playlist where they are all in, <clears throat> and you can watch them. But I warn you, it's about 30 hours of watching and listening. I, I warn you on the one hand, but on the other hand, I ask you to do it because this will be the most interesting 30 hours that you would probably ever spend in front of a TV screen or uh, a screen on, on, of your computer. But please, Tom, continue with your explanation. Yes. Now, understanding what I've just previously said, common sense dictates that the papacy, the true antichrist of the Bible, once he has convinced all the former Protestant churches that the Antichrist is a one single individual, not a dynasty of popes throughout the history of the Roman Catholic Church, but one single individual that comes seven years before Christ's return, while off in the distant future, once the whole Christian world believes that lie, they've exonerated the papacy. And the papacy can now stand up and say, now, you don't believe the papacy is the Antichrist anymore, do you? You believe in a future single individual that's going to be the Antichrist. Well, what about the Protestant Reformation then? You stole all of Europe from me. You liberated all of Europe from my rightful control. Now, if you do not any longer believe that the papacy and every pope throughout the Roman Catholic Church is the Antichrist of the Bible, and you believe in a future Antichrist, a single individual that signs a peace treaty with Israel, then you have to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. You left the Roman Catholic Church because you taught that the Pope was the Antichrist, the papacy was the Antichrist. You don't believe that anymore, so you have to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. And not only that, but you have to restore to me all the power and all the domains, all the land, all the the control of the governments and everything that I had before the Protestant Reformation. You have to restore the quote-unquote patrimony of Peter. You have to restore my rightful throne as king of kings and lord of lords in the world. You believe in a single individual way off in the future, you've exonerated the papacy. The whole history of the Roman Catholic Church, you've exonerated this. Morality dictates that you must come back to the Roman Catholic Church, put yourself in submission to the papacy, and help the papacy restore everything that it lost at the Protestant Reformation. You have to destroy your King James Bible. You have to destroy your Wycliffe Bibles. You have to destroy your, your Pilgrim Bibles and all these Protestant Bibles, and you have to read our version of the Bible, or rather you have to let our priest tell you what that Bible says. You have to give up your protest. You can't protest anymore. You've defied your own claim. You once said that it was the papacy. Now you believe in a single individual. Now I have the right. I, as the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, have the right to rule this world spiritually and temporally. And since you, with your own mouth have repudiated your own original belief, your Protestant belief, and believe in a future Antichrist, 
you have to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. You have to submit to my rightful and divine authority. And you have to submit to my government and my economy and my social structure. And the world is mine now. And you have but a short period of time to make up your mind. The, the Vatican Council II was an ultimatum. It ended in 1965. We've got nearly 50 years since Vatican Council II. Time is up for Protestants. You either come back to the Roman Catholic Church, or we now have the right to take you out and do to you what we did to all the Protestants before we lost our power. We extirpated and annihilated the heretics. Now this Pope is calling for a year of mercy. A year of mercy. What it really is, is a final warning. They didn't put this, this year of mercy as the anniversary of Vatican Council II for no reason. It's our, it's our last and final warning from the Roman Catholic Church. She's gathered together all to herself all the power and prestige and authority that she had before the Protestant Reformation. That means the, the papacy acknowledges that it now controls the government of the United States, and it will become a, it, it will become a violation of civil law not to comply with the new government that, it, that is now established in Washington, D.C. The Vatican Council II was an ultimatum, and when you ex accept the papacy as the spiritual power, you must also accept his temporal power, and that gives the Roman Catholic Church carte blanche power in Washington, D.C., because now the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church not only represent the card-carrying Roman Catholics in this country, about 24%, but they also represent the capitulators, the Protestants, who don't protest anymore. They can walk into Washington, D.C. now and say that we don't just represent the Roman Catholics. Since Vatican Council II, we represent all Christians of the United States. And we have a political mandate that cannot be overthrown. Christianity, that is Roman Catholicism, rules the United States of America. And we want laws to make this country a Catholic country. Now, they're going to use the word Christian, but it's not Christianity at all. It's the Church of Antichrist. And so the synagogue once, of Satan. The synagogue of Satan, and, and once the government is under the complete control of this man in Rome, who's coming to speak to Congress, he says on the behalf of the American citizens, he's got a mandate. He's got a mandate, and that mandate is going to require that the government of this country extirpate and annihilate the heretics, just like they did in France, just like they did throughout the old world order. See, the old world order, the new world order is just the old world order restored. There's nothing new about it. They just call it new to throw everybody off. The new world order is simply the old world order restored. The papacy is in complete control of the government. It's in complete control of the churches. They all teach now that the Pope's not the Antichrist. The papacy is not the Antichrist. The Roman Catholic Church is the Christian Church. And we must all come under her skirt. And the harlot daughters are going home to Mama, the Roman Catholic Church. So now they have a completely, un a completely unchallengeable political mandate and a political agenda that not only affects the United States of America, but the whole world. Through the power and strength and influence of the United States, they're conquering the whole world for the Pope and restoring everything that he had before the Protestant Reformation. 
They're paying it. They're paying for it with our tax dollars. They're paying for it with our church tithes. They're paying for it by every and any means. And uh, that's why the Pope now can stand up before the world and pronounce a, you know, a year of mercy, professing himself to be charitable and merciful. There's no mercy whatsoever. This is a deadline. This is a line in the sand. Beyond this point, there will be no more tolerance for those who don't uphold the Vatican's agenda for a global government. You call yourself an American patriot? You better change your views and get on board with this global government because the Pope's going to rule the world. Now, we all have a decision to make. Are we going to serve the Pope, the phony King of kings and Lord of lords, or are we going to fight till till the death against him? I have but one king and one lord. He governs my conscience through the Bible. He's not flesh and blood. He's as bright, shining as the sun. And the Pope is darkness. The man of sin, the son of perdition, exactly what the Protestant reformers called him. And I'm going to speak out until God takes my last breath against him. Yes, I'm for Christ, but I'm also against Antichrist. Because if I remain silent and everybody else like me remains silent, the whole world will continue to think this is the man of God when he's the man of sin. That he's a representative of the Son of God when he's the son of perdition. It's crunch time for Christians. We've got to open our Bibles. We've got to read it like our lives depend on it. We've got to repent of our sins, and we've got to seek Christ and him alone. And we have to renounce his counterfeit in this world. He now controls the kings of the earth, just like he did in the old world order. And they've got their sights on our lives. They're going to kill us. That's what it's all about. That's what it was all about in the first, in the old world order. That's what it's going to be like in the old world, in the new world order. They're one and the same. If there's a 2,000 year gap, there you found it. We had liberty after the Protestant Reformation. Now that we've repudiated our Protestantism, we have become slaves of the papacy. And it's our own government that's going to impose it upon us. Are you losing your rights? Are you losing your liberties? Are you losing your freedom of speech, your freedom of conscience, your freedom of religion? If you you don't feel it yet, you soon will. You've already lost your health care. You have to bow to the kings of Washington, D.C. to get health care in this country. You have to pay out your nose to get health care in this country. They're going to link our support to this new world order to every necessity of life. You won't be able to buy or sell unless you go along with this new world order. And remember, it's simply the old world order restored. You don't have to be deceived. You don't have to be undecided. You don't have to be ignorant about who is ruling this world. It's the God of this world. Satan himself and his vicar in Rome. And he's coming to this country to speak on behalf of the citizens of this country. Now, who are the citizens of this country? Those who agree with him. And those who disagree with him are not citizens of this country. And that means the government can do anything it wants with us. I hope I've made it clear. The year of mercy, it's no such thing. 
Another reason why the Pope's calling for a year of mercy is because the whole world stands in judgment against his pedophile priests. As mute as they are, as quiet as they are, the world now knows about the global priest pandemic. The global pedophile priest pandemic. The Roman Catholic priesthood is condemned in every nation of the world. Everywhere there are priestly pedophiles, the, the people are in outrage. And the Pope just wants to get on with the healing. Well, there's no healing. The priests still prey on little children because they're sodomites. And why are they sodomites? Because they're idolaters. They suffer the divine recompense for reducing God to a filthy man-made image and to hide their pedophilia instead of practicing their corruption and filthiness on one another. They take it out on little kids that they can threaten and silence all over the world. And the world has become aware of it. The world stands in condemnation of it. But the priest just wants to forgive and forget. The papacy just wants to forgive and forget. So he wants a year of mercy when he's ready to lop off our heads. Rome never changes. The only thing that changes is the calendar. Day after day after day, the man of sin rules and counterfeits Christ and contradicts him in almost every way. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. You took the words right off my mouth when you said, of course, that the new world order is nothing else than the old world order just restored. I mean, it is so blatant to the eye, to the people who study this at least a little bit, um, that they... <clears throat> that they really do not understand what, what that means because in the time before the Reformation the Pope ruled all through the world. He was given 1260 years time and times and the dividing of times uh, three and a half prophetic years to reign and, and that was when, when we had the Dark Ages and we had, when we had the Inquisition and, uh, and all these things and uh, all these things will come back to those people who will not bow down to the Pope but I will just, uh, for the record, finish reading this article on the Year of Mercy. Quote, The Pope told the faithful at St. Peter's Basilica, quote, Dear brothers and sisters, I have thought about how the Church can make clear its mission of being a witness of mercy. It is a journey that starts with a spiritual conversion. For this reason, I have decided, <laughs> listen, I have decided, he is God on earth, to declare an extraordinary jubilee that has the mercy of God at its center. Who is mercy? The mercy of God. Well, who is he talking about? Himself. He is God on earth. This extraordinary jubilee has the mercy of God as its center. Means him as its center. It will be a holy year of mercy. I am convinced that the whole church will be able to find in this jubilee the joy of rediscovering and making fruitful the mercy of God, my mercy, with other words, with which we are all called to give consolation to every man and every woman of our time, end quote. Francis added, entrusting the holy year to Mary, mother of mercy. If that wasn't enough, entrusting the holy year to Mary, what did we start this broadcast with? Um, idolatry. What, what idolatry. Idolatry. <laughs> yes, the statues of Mary in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, when, when, you, when, you, when you are a Christian and you take five minutes' time reading this article and understand what he actually says, this should really make you shiver. Yes, it should. Mary lies peacefully in her grave, waiting the resurrection of the righteous. She declared her own son her savior. And uh, she had many children after, at least three brothers, and we know at least two sisters. She was not a perpetual virgin. She's not a co-mediatrix. She's not a co-redemptrix. She was not translated into heaven. 
She lies peacefully in her grave. She's not to be worshipped, only her son. And uh, she is just like any other good Jewish woman that wished to become the mother of the Savior. And she was granted that, and it was by God's overshadowing that she conceived. And uh, she's blessed among women, there's no doubt about it. But she's not our Savior. She had no part in our redemption. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church builds its entire faith around the Queen of Heaven, who they call Mary, the same one worshipped by the apostate Jews before they were sent into captivity. And, uh, you know, the, the Pope puts himself in a position only God could call a Jubilee. He made it a law. I think it was like every 50 years in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Israelite economy, all debts were to be forgiven. Think about this, Yerk. You know what the Federal, ba- the Federal Reserve banks are. They're Jesuit banks. They are the ones who have indebted this country beyond its ability to pay. All of Europe is, is a debtor, a slave debtor to the Jesuits who control the central banking system all over this world. Now, if the Pope really is going to declare a jubilee, all debts would be forgiven, wouldn't they? And maybe even the Pope would give us back our gold and take away our fiat currency and give us real value in our money. You know, when I go to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread, I take real wealth, that bread that can sustain my life, that costs money to raise the wheat and to grind it and to reduce it to flour, and then that costs money to bake it into bread. For that real wealth that can sustain, sustain my life, that food called bread, I give fiat currency that isn't worth the value printed on the paper. It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't represent gold. It doesn't represent silver. It doesn't represent anything but debt. For every loaf of bread, I exchange to the baker an IOU. It's just a portion of our national debt. That makes me a thief, Yerk. It makes every one of us a thief. This is how Satan has corrupted the world through the papacy. If the Pope really was a man of God, and even had the power to proclaim a a jubilee, he would erase all of our debts, all of his ill-gotten gains. But that's not what he's going to do. He uses biblical language to describe his diabolical system. That's the truth. That's the truth. Back to you, Jürgen. Thank you, Tom, for your elaboration. I've prepared another article, as you know. Uh, This comes from news.va, the official Vatican network, and it's also very interesting to read. I think that after reading and analyzing this last article, we will stop our broadcast for today and will take the encyclical on climate change uh, for another broadcast, if that's all right with you, because we already have more than an hour going here. And I want to keep it uh, a little bit shorter so that people also watch the videos because I've heard two hours and longer people cannot sit still and watch the videos. <laughs> um, I'd like to keep it with this article right now that comes from news.va. And um, this article is called Pope Francis. Religion should not be confined to quote-unquote personal conscience. Well, I guess Tom has a lot to say when I just read this, but I will start first here, or do you want to make a, cont- uh, a comment oh, yeah. right now, Tom, before I start? I'll just tell, <laughs> just tell you that what, what, what lay behind the Protestant Reformation was when Martin Luther read the Bible for himself, and he discovered that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone not by works, not by sacraments, not by a regular confession of the priest, not by praying to the dead, not by praying to the Pope, not by praying to any of the Roman Catholic saints. The Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan. It was the counterfeit of the kingdom of Christ. And Martin Luther came out, and from then on, he allowed the scriptures to dictate his conscience. And he conscientiously rebelled or protested against the Roman Catholic Church. Conscience is Protestantism. 
when the scriptures mold our consciences and bind our consciences, we are conscientiously biblical in our beliefs and our faith and our practice. This is the very thing that the papacy now denounces. The Bible cannot and shall not be any authority in the New World Order. It's the decrees of the popes and the councils and the, and the so-called holy fathers of the Roman Catholic Church that will dictate our consciences from now on. Or we will be called rebels, domestic terrorists, anything they can say to demonize us. What is being attacked here, when they attack the conscience, is attacking the Bible and attacking Christ. That's why we call him Antichrist. Back to you, Yerk. Yes, um, that brings me back to that uh, one citation that I already read a few times, I think, that comes from the book Rome and Civil Liberty by J.A. Wiley. And that goes with what you said about conscience, because J.A. Wiley stated in his book, quote, God alone is Lord of the conscience. And that was the truth that set Europe free, unquote. That was the time of the liberation, because nothing else was the Reformation. It was liberation from the yoke of Rome, from the yoke of Antichrist, where the people for the first time in history could read the Bibles on their own. And of course, the Roman Catholic Church does not agree with that, that you read the Bible on your own, that you understand the Bible on your own without any help of any priest, because the Roman Catholic Church says the supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith and destructive of unity. It's unhistorical. And you can read that for yourself in the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 496. But I want to turn now to this article that Pope Francis says religion should not be confined to personal conscience. And this is exactly a continuation of things that he has said before, uh, where he said that there is no uh, personal relationship with God possible, right? That's something that he said before, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Tom, can you help me here with that? That's uh, some weeks ago, right? Absolutely. The priest is a mediator. In the Roman Catholic Church, the priest through the Pope are the mediators to God. That we can't speak directly to God. That that was the whole. That was part of the reason why the Protestants protested the Church. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So the article reads as follows: the orderly development of quote a civil pluralistic society requires that the authentic spirit of religion not to be confined to personal conscience, but that its significant role in the construction of society is recognized, said Pope Francis in his remarks to the Italian president. Pope Francis met with Italian president Sergio Mattarella at the Vatican Saturday morning. It was their first meeting since the president's election on February 3, 2015. The church offers everybody the beauty of the gospel and its message of salvation and to carry out its spiritual mission. It needs conditions of peace and calm, which only public authorities can promote, unquote. The Pope said, reflecting on the collaborative relationship between the Holy See and the Italian state, as defined by the Lateran Pacts and the Italian Constitution. I'm going to stop right here because I know that Tom is going to say something. <laughs> There's yeah. so much in this little paragraph already oh. when, well, when he says, the gospel indeed. in the special of... Oh, come, come on, Tom, take indeed. over. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, you know. Uh, first, he denounces the conscience, which is literally to denounce the Bible and to denounce Christ and to denounce God's people reading that Bible and having their consciences dictated to by the Scriptures, by the law of God. And then he calls upon the power of the state. He says, that, quote, the church offers everyone the beauty of the gospel, which is another gospel, not the gospel of the Bible, And its message of salvation, of course, we know salvation in the Roman Catholic Church is never confirmed. The the Roman Catholic Church has always said anybody who believes that, anybody who says that they are saved are guilty of the the sin of, of, uh, what's the word they use? Presumption. You presume too much if you say you're saved, right? That's how they attack Protestantism. 
and to carry out its spiritual mission. I'll tell you what the spiritual mission of the Roman Catholic Church is, to create a counterfeit kingdom, a global kingdom that is counterfeit to Christ. It needs conditions of peace and calm. This is a contradiction from the get-go, because we know the Roman Catholic Church calls itself the church militant. We've also got on record Roman Catholic prelates <clears throat> throughout history saying that the church is most dynamic when she's at war and not at peace. Okay, The Jesuits, we know, are the fomenters of war all over the world. The Roman Catholic Church is a church militant. They claim it's so, and it is so. It says, which only public authorities, get this, which only public authorities can promote. In other words, the papacy is helpless without the assistance and help of public authorities. And what are the public authorities? The governments of the world. Remember, the new world order is simply the old world order restored. The papacy had no power unless he could compel the kings of the earth to do his bidding and to rule the people with his, and to enforce Roman Catholic canon law and the decrees of the popes. <clears throat> the pope has no army. The pope can't impose anything upon the people of the earth unless he has the cooperation of the public authorities. This is the civil power, the governments of the world. And he has that power. And, and cooperation from public authorities, from the civil power. He calls himself the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in his documents. In Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope is King of all kings. He rules over the kings of the earth. We're talked, we've, talk, we've been told about that city, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's the smallest city on the earth. It's only 108 acres. It, call it calls itself the Holy See, and it is the Holy See of the Roman Catholic Church that rules over the kings of the earth. History is repeating itself. He says, he says, which only public authorities can promote, reflecting on the collaborative relationship between the Holy See and the Italian state. And it isn't just the Italian state that he controls. He controls the United States. He controls the United States of Europe. He controls every land. And every land that he does not control is currently under the military objective of the United States of America. Okay? Go on, Yerk. <clears throat> yeah, Tom, what it actually all comes down to is that the Pope is three in one. He is the persecutor, he is the judge, and he is the executor of his own law. Right. Okay, I'm going to continue reading this article. Quote, on the other hand, public authorities who are primarily expected to create the conditions for just and sustain, uh, sustainable development so that civil society can develop all its potentialities can find a valuable and useful support for their action in the commitment and loyal collaboration of the church, unquote, he said. Now the moral, the moral authority which, with which the civil powers or the governments of the earth can create a sustainable development and a tolerable existence for all mankind, it can only do it through the collaboration with the Roman Catholic Church. That's what he said. Exactly. The, the article continues, though independent church and state share the so-called, uh, the quote, common responsibility, unquote, of meeting people's spiritual and physical needs with humility and dedication, he said. Okay. The Pope says, the church and the state together have a common responsibility. The Roman Catholic Church and every government on the, in the world have a common responsibility. What is that responsibility? To meet all the people's spiritual and physical needs. Is, did the, where is that written in the Bible? Somebody show me where God said, you must rely upon the Roman Catholic Church and the government of your country to jointly 
provide all of your spiritual and physical needs. Anybody? Can you find that in the Bible anywhere? I rest my case. This is the synagogue of Satan. This is the man of sin, the son of perdition. We're not to look to Christ or his provision or his morality. We're to look to the church and the state. That's the counterfeit kingdom. It's plain as the nose on your face. You just need somebody to show it to you for the first time. Go ahead, Yerk. The dragon gave him power and authority, and that is, of course, how he speaks, like a dragon. The Pope spoke of the impact of Christianity. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the Pope spoke of the impact of Christianity on Italian culture, including art, architecture, customs, and family life. He emphasized the need to care for the environment and to develop employment opportunities for Italian youth. Now, this is very interesting. He emphasized the need to care for the environment, and this is exactly where we can make the bridge to our next broadcast, where we will be talking about the encyclical of the climate change, all this environmental stuff, this Gaia movement, uh, loving Mother Earth and restore nature, uh, which you shouldn't destroy in the first place, but you should take care of, that nobody does anymore. This little paragraph here directly leads to our next broadcast that I don't want you to miss, where we go on the Pope Francis new climate change and cyclical sneak preview, and of course um, his agenda when he comes to speak before the American Joint Session of Congress in September 2015. But first I will end with the last paragraph of this article that goes, quote, He also expressed gratitude for Ital Italy's commitment to welcoming numerous mi migrants who land on the country's shores and urged Italian authorities to petition the European and international communities to greater commitment to assistance in the area of migration. End quote of the article. Now, this last paragraph is very interesting because, you know, last week, I don't know if you were here, heard that in America, but there was again a boat um, uh, uh, sunk between Africa and uh, on, on its way to Italy, where a lot of uh, refugees from the African continent come over here to Europe, and 800 people drowned uh, in, in that. And, of course, he takes that on. And uh, there was, uh, as far as I know, a special meeting of European leaders, I guess it was today or yesterday, or one of these days, uh, dealing with, this, um, uh, with these refugees coming, coming to here, uh, economic refugees, you know, because... They have been taking every chance in their own country, so that's why they seek their luck uh, everywhere else. And most of the time they go to Europe. And when you see how many people, how many refugees are coming to Germany right now, uh, last year, I don't have the, the, the numbers right here, but it has never been that great a number before. I think it's in the millions already that they come to Germany. It's uh, abhorrent. But please, uh, Tom, you probably have some closing remarks on this article and the last two paragraphs that I just read. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, the previous article catches my attention most uh, powerfully. Look, God created the heavens and the earth, and all that in them is. He created man, and he told man to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But the papacy says that God, the creator of all heaven and earth, and all that in them is, and who created man and told him to be fruitful and to fill the earth was inept because he put us on the earth that could not sustain a whole earth full of people. He didn't give us enough oil. He didn't give us enough wood. He didn't give us enough air. He didn't give us enough water. He didn't give us enough sunshine. He provided an environment that if we did what he said and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, that we would create an in, uninhabitable earth just by global warming up, uh, alone. That our carbon emissions would create a quote-unquote greenhouse effect and multitudes would die. God was a fool, according to the papacy, for creating an earth that could not sustain us. You hear all this talk about sustainable growth, sustainable this, sustainable that. It's a charge against the God of creation that he didn't put us on a sustainable planet.
of a, a sustainable earth. He's not all holy. He's not all perfect. He's not all knowing. That he's worthy of criticism. That he's worthy of ridicule. And he's worthy of contradiction. And so where does the contradiction come from? The papacy. All all of this global warming comes right from the papacy. The Antichrist of the Bible. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, he said God is not good, so we're going to create our own God. That's right. That's just the other uh, agenda that they are going. Um, yep. There are a few videos that I watched from uh, Pastor Mike, Mike Hoggart, uh, on YouTube. He deals with this um, singularity, the mixing of machines and men, making their own God, quoting Kurtz, uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who was a former CEO or something there in, in Google, a very high person in Google anyway, who says that this... Um, Uh, this will happen about the year 2045, the merging of machine and uh, man. Making, man making their own God because the God of the Bible is not good enough. Yeah. That's what it all comes down to. Yeah. Now, a good Bible-believing Christian will recite the passage in the Scripture that says that God is coming to destroy those who are polluting the earth. According to God's word, how is it that man pollutes the earth? By false doctrine, by sin, by idolatry, by simony, by sodomy. God put us in an environment that heals itself. It has healing as its most basic characteristic. Do you realize that we're living in the end of human existence on the earth? That God will soon come and judge man and destroy this earth with fire and give us a new heaven and a new earth? There won't be any pollution in it. There won't be any sin in it. But man will still produce waste, right? Is it what God is talking about in the Scripture when he says he's coming to judge those who pollute the earth? Is he talking about farmers? Is he talking about uh, 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 garbage dumps? Is he talking about wastewater plants? No, he's talking about those who pollute the world with lies and false doctrines and false prophecies, false kings, false prophets, false messiahs, false Christs. They are the ones who pollute the earth and pollute man's mind and pollute man's heart. The earth heals itself. God gave us the rain to wash the filth out of the earth. He gave the soil, the microbes in the soil, to eat it and render it harmless. Now, I've got a little common sense. You've got a monkey around with nuclear power plants, you ought to find a safe way to do it. Yes, it's possible for man to pollute the earth, but that's not what God's talking about. Those who pollute the earth are centered in the Vatican. False doctrines, false biblical teachings, corruption of the Bible, corruption of man's hearts. That's where the pollution is comes from, and that's what Jesus is going to destroy when he returns. Now, as far as all this, 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 this talk about migrants and uh, pluralism and a global society of, of, of uh, 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 you know, com- of, of uh, what's the word they always use? The civil society of uh, pluralism, that's all fancy talk, but what's behind it all is to destroy national sovereignties. When you put Mexicans in the United States and you mix up the populations of the world, you tear down the nations that God built at the Tower of Babel. To make them all one again. To make them all one again. And to make it to, you know, if, if the United States is full of Muslims, than to silence any 
uh, that would be the purpose of that would be to silence any criticism of Islam. Another false religion. All of it is designed to stop the spread of the Bible and the gospel truth. It all comes and, down to man's spirituality and not to God's spirituality. That's that right. is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Humanism, humanism and man is spiritual and man is God himself. That is yeah. exactly what started in the Garden of Eden with the deception when Satan said, when you eat of these apples, you will be like gods. Yep, knowing both good and evil. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't want to know evil anymore. I've quite had enough of evil. <laughs> I'd like to know what it is to live in a world where there's no sin. I don't have to have a lock on my door. I don't have to have a bank account. I make my own wealth out of the ground that God gives the increase. I don't want sin anymore. That's the That's the existence that I long for, and God promised it to all of us who would believe in him. I don't want to live in a world any longer where there is both good and evil, because we've seen where that got us. Whether it be Democrats or Republicans, whether it be socialists or communists or fascists, no government of men is ever going to bring in Christ's righteousness. But the Pope says he can mix up all the races, all the cultures, all the nations, and make the world one nation over which he can rule. He wants to destroy the pristine gospel of Jesus Christ and replace it with every pagan religion on the planet and call that God by any name. It truly is a return to the time just after the flood when the whole world answered to one man, and they rebelled in unison against the Creator. That's where we're headed, and the man of sin is the one responsible for it all, because he worships not Christ, but the dragon, and so do the kings of the earth over whom he rules. Thanks, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. You know, there's nothing new under the world. History And that's nothing new under the sun. History just repeats itself. But when the people do not read the Bible and do not know the history, they do not know that there is nothing new, but that it's only a repetition of things that have been there already long, long time before. The Tower of Babel is exactly what they are rebuilding right now. And uh, we were speaking, uh, speaking about that already in other broadcasts. Anyway... I want to bring this broadcast here to an end. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Tom. It was uh, very fine uh, having this discussion with you, and you very well explained all the points that were made here uh, from the second commandment change of the Roman Catholic Catechism on the one hand and from the article that we read from the Catholic Herald and this last article that we read right here. So I thank you very much for your contribution and your time you, you, that you spent with us here. I also want to thank Walt Stickle to set this call up on Hour of the Truth. And uh, I want to remind the, uh, the listener and the watcher of the video to go to the website granddesignexposed.com where you can find much more information on the things that we did here. And uh, I think we have had now, with reading the last article, a wonderful bridge made to the next week's broadcast when we will start on the encyclical on the climate change and um, Pope Francis's view of um, what he will do when he comes to speak in September 2015 on behalf, never forget that, on behalf of the American people to a joint session of Congress when he comes there next week. So I thank you very much for listening to the broadcast and watching the video. I wish you all a nice day. Until the next time, God bless you and bye-bye. <laughs>